My name is Marissa Asland, and presently, currently, I am a therapist counselor here in Durango, Colorado. I have a private practice, and my specialty is working with athletes and athletic types. Um, I do a lot of sports psychology and some subsets from there. And my background, um, besides my clinical background, I was a professional uh, bike racer for 10 years, triathlete for two of those. I know the iron horse, the ins and the outs, pretty darn well. My name is Todd Wells. I've been a professional cyclist for 23 years, lived in Durango for over 25 years, and have participated in the Iron Horse on numerous occasions. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the Iron Horse Bicycle Classic. Train takes off, and so do we. Here today we're looking at it, it's full of cars, but on race day it's full of cyclists. You know, there tends to be a lot of people waving us on, so I say take that in right now. Positive energy here all through town. Everyone out there has a different goal. Some people, they want to they wanna win the race. Other people, maybe they want to make it in the time cut. Other people, they want to beat their friends. It's a cool race in that there's a, a lot of different abilities and everyone has their own goal and it's a cool atmosphere at the finish. Some people are like really fearful of this ride and I say well yeah it's hard but it's not climbing Mount Everest like if you're trained you can do it so not being so fearful of it but then I also see the other direction of people that are very laissez-faire about it and it's like no this is hard so I, I really encourage the riders recreational riders to try to find sort of that middle ground of like this is challenging and it's doable so I think even just having like those you know affirmations or mantras in the head can be good it's pretty flat from Durango all the way until you get to the base of Shalona, which comes about 15 miles maybe into the ride. Shalona is, I would say, it's probably the steepest climb of the whole course. This is the place where I say, and I really like to be aggressive. Um, I've got you know, a lot of confidence in my riding ability, so I'm gonna push the pace a little bit on Shalona here. So my strategy is gonna be to try to tease out who's really gonna be in contention. From a racer standpoint, you're gonna try to be more aggressive. From a recreational standpoint, I would say it's gonna end soon. It's not like it's, this is only like a two mile climb. It's gonna get a little bit more mellow from here. So I, you know, not to freak out basically. Get over Shalona, reassess, be really conservative between Shalona and Purgatory. This is where the race really starts to string out from the front to the back and it rolls a little bit on the way up so you know you'll be able to to push it on the climbs you get a little bit of reprieve on the descents and this is another area where you can save some energy because if you're if you're with a fast group on the descents you can sit at the back of that get a little bit of drafting and maybe you can go 25 miles an hour without pedaling whereas if you're by yourself you got to pedal and you're only going 20 miles an hour this is the place in again in my opinion to be the most conservative out of the entire race um, you're you're probably not going to make much headway um, riding too strong here once you once you can see that needle store you're dropping down to it that's a that's a nice feeling because you know that it it rolls gradual downhill from there this is a really pretty place too. So psychologically, look around, take it in because this is um, this is why we do this sport. So really, really beautiful scenery. So take it in right now. And we're going past Purgatory, and again, this is a nice section because you've been doing a pretty sustained climb for um, quite a while, and here you get a nice reprieve. Call it kind of the Purgatory Flats area. This is where I would be starting to really fuel taking in a little bit more hydration, a little bit of something to eat. I would be really trying to stay conservative through this area because in about two to three miles, we're gonna make that really steep right turn into Colbank Pass. Then you know you're in for a, for a long, long time pushing hard on the pedals. Colbank Pass will take anywhere. The, the fastest riders maybe do it in 25 minutes, maybe 30. Some people will take an hour and a half, maybe two hours to get up coal bank. Recreational riders, please, please know that you're starting to ride now about 10,000 feet. The slower and steadier you can ride, 
the better and the easier it's going to be. Standing up out of the saddle and accelerating a lot is going to really um, tax you at this sort of altitude. It's very hard to recover from that. It can feel like you're kind of stuck in this big picture. You see the curve, but it's taking you forever to get there. It feels like you're not going anywhere. One thing I always look for is there's a tower off to the left. And you know when you can see that tower that there's only one more chicane or curve to go before you top out at the top of Colbank Pass. Usually at this point there's a lot of people cheering on the side so um, trying to get some motivation from inside is really, really challenging. I think more of an external type of motivation is really helpful. Thinking about the party in Silverton, thinking about the beautiful mountains, thinking about, you know, if you have family or friends um, or laughing at the people on the side of the road. Kind of like before, take it in. I like to look around, take a breath here at the top, and then we're coming into the downhill you have about a three mile descent down and it's awesome. I mean, the pros will go down it without using their brakes and we have the whole road. They close the road to traffic so you have the whole road to use both lanes. I like to be a little bit conservative just because, hey, we're on one centimeter of rubber going, whatever, 35 miles an hour downhill. Maybe a little bit different than some other riders. You see it on TV, it looks crazy. If you're doing it in person, it's, you know, it, it's three times as scary. You're down it before you know it, and you can see the big bend that is the start of Mollus Pass, so it's a gradual climb. The good news on this pass is it is much shorter, and all you gotta do is get to the top of this. Just get to the top of Mollus, and we're good to go. On Mollus, it's really crunch time for the guys that maybe they're better climbers than sprinters. They want to get away before the top. But you, you roll for probably two miles across the top and then you dive into the pine trees. Now this descent is a little bit tricky. There is going to be a couple little places where you're going to start pedaling again. Um, I like this because I think it kind of warms the body up. It can be a little bit chilly going down into Silverton. So I actually take the opportunity to put it into my big gear and really kind of push another another little bit just to get my quads warmed up again. It's cool too, you're, you're catching glimpses of the town as you're zipping down the road and it, it's hard to really look over and take it all in. Last curve, here we go, we're into Silverton. There's a uh, beautiful Kendall Mountain in front of us. This is a really deceiving finish. You can see the finish line for a long time. So in the race, it's timing the sprint just right. A lot of people get excited, they'll go a little bit early but it's gradual uphill to the finish line, so you don't get there as fast as you envision yourself. I would say wait until you see the actual finish banner and then ride at the last minute. If you can come around a rider, that's when you sprint and you're done. If you haven't done it, I would highly suggest it.